Hi everyone, thanks for taking the time to be here. My name is Sarah Butt and I work for Salesforce SRE. Today, we're going to talk about three ways that you can enhance your incident response based on techniques used in the medical field. I wanna start with why this is relevant. By nature, medicine is full of critical systems and life and limb decisions. Technology, on the other hand, did not fundamentally start out as critical systems that required multiple nines of availability for most use cases. It was around the turn of the century that technical systems became central to multiple industries to the point that having a down or a degraded system would actually stop business and in some cases would impact those life and limb situations. So with that shift, learnings from the medical field became very useful in how we handle incidents. I wanna set a few expectations here. The first is that nothing I present is going to be a one size fits all solution. My hope is that you leave this talk able to ask good questions within your organization and think over how these concepts might help your company's incident response. The second thing that I wanna say is that this talk builds on your organization already having an incident management system implemented with some standard best practices. So if I say things like incident commander or span of control, and those are new or kind of fuzzy terms to you, I would research more into that before you try and apply the things that we're going to discuss today. The last bit of expectation setting that I want to do is say nothing that I'm going to present here today is a silver bullet, nor should any of this ever become a ceiling that squishes in your organization. These are concepts that are designed to be additional foundational components and robust incident response. They're not designed to be some sort of solution that you shoehorn your organization into and say, all right, incident response, all good. These are concepts for you to take away and consider in light of your own incident management system. They're not blanket prescriptions. So the first concept that we'll talk about is algorithm guided decisions. First, let's talk about what it looks like in medicine. So how many people here have watched a medical drama on TV and heard the term code blue? I know out there someone is going to be another old school Grey's Anatomy fan, right? Um, so you heard this term code blue and it's like mass chaos and heroics, right? Um, a spoiler alert is that in an actual hospital, it would be very rare to see that sort of chaotic response. In real life, you almost never run during an emergency. Running pretty much universally doesn't help. Mass chaos, like you see on TV, is largely theatrics, and nobody can work with a clear head in that state. Does this sound like a little bit familiar to SRE incidents, maybe? So what do you see during a code? You see people calmly stepping up to known roles. You then see, normally, a very planned, algorithm-guided decisions response. It might look something like this. So if a patient has a cardiac event, this is one of the ACLS algorithms that might be followed. There are multiple of them, depending on which concerning cardiac rhythm the patient is in. This is just the one that I happen to grab. But what I want you to notice is how fundamentally um, this is an algorithm that enables quick standardized decision making. It isn't this run book where you go one, two, three, though it may lead to run books being run. What it is, though, is a decision tree that helps quickly make standardized general decisions when in an, in an extremely time sensitive setting where you have limited information. So let's go ahead and move back into SRE land. What can we learn from that type of algorithm guided decision based approach? The first thing is standardization. It does not matter what hospital you go to, what ambulance picks you up, if you're having a severe cardiac event everybody's going to run the same ACLS protocols. That level of standardization means that anybody with the right training and certificates and such can run a code. As an SRE, um, how many times have you been on a bridge and you've had to wait for a specific person or a team because they're the only ones who knew how to do X or they had this special way to do Y? Uh, this algorithm guided approach that enables a lot of standardization helps reduce the human single point of failure factor as well as the human bottleneck factor. The second thing is generalization. So we'll talk a bit more about this later, but at a high level, notice that this protocol does not rely on knowing a detailed why. No one is like, hmm, sitting there pondering why multiple factors over a span of years resulted in the patient being in the state that they're in. Instead, they're quickly placing the patient in front of them in some of these general buckets, in this case, based on heart rhythm. They're then using this algorithm to figure out what sort of general response they can provide to give life-saving treatments 
quickly. So in SRE, when you start thinking about how you want teams to initially react to an incident, you can and should apply the same approach. It begins with asking, how do we generalize possible situations, symptoms, and treatments? So for example, if you have a network issue, how do you build out an algorithm for different ways to respond and treat and mitigate? What about if you have a database problem? What about if you get alerts on an ECDN? The key here is to generalize enough that you have algorithms that are flexible and quickly get teams moving in an organized manner, but also broad enough that you have um, flexible situations you can use and you're not wading through hundreds of these algorithms trying to find the right one in a moment of urgency um, because they're all too specific. You, can, you can't just hopelessly kind of wade through hundreds of algorithms and expect to be quick to respond to something. So keep in mind, these algorithms aren't leading you towards a long-term fix. They're leading you towards treating the urgent situation in front of you. Our second concept relates to the first. I wanna talk about rapid stabilization. I recognize that this is a concept that's going to be familiar for a lot of SREs. Hang with me because even if you're already familiar with this concept, there's a takeaway for you here. So the medical world has robust protocols for dealing with emergency situations such as traumas. You might have heard of triage systems, perhaps the phrase stop the bleeding. The idea is to have a plan to stop or mitigate impact as soon as possible even if you're operating on limited information or you're in an unstable situation. That sounds a little familiar, right? The bottom line here is that when you're in the middle of a critical incident, a deep understanding of why is relatively unimportant. Why gets dealt with later. You can do that in an after action review. There's other places you can do that. All you care about is how to stop or minimize the impact. Um, if you wanna go deeper into this, there's a great paper that talks about the mindset of the recessionist and talks about recessionist and intensivist and the difference between the two, I highly recommend it. But for now, for our purposes, this is a simplified overview of the Advanced Trauma Life Support Protocol. Basically, you start by taking a moment to look around. You ask yourself questions like, is the scene safe? Who's yelling? Who's quiet? Once you're with the patient, you evaluate what their urgent concerns are and you provide urgent action. So if they don't have an airway and they can't breathe, you get an airway. If they are bleeding, you stop the bleeding. If they don't have a heart rate, you would start to administer CPR. Once you apply those urgent treatments, you then would take another survey. You'd see if they've improved. You'd see if another problem has sprung up. You would collect various other data points. From there, you take all of that information and you make a decision if you need to go back and apply more urgent actions or if the patient is stable enough for you to move them towards definitive care. So what does that mean for SRE? There's a few takeaways here that I think are relevant. The most important one is to solve the right problem at the right time. It's really important, so I'm gonna say it again. Solve the right problem at the right time. Stop the proverbial bleeding immediately or as close to immediately as you can. In some cases, you might be doing something to help, such as failing over to DR without even knowing what the original problem that caused your incident is. That's fine. Until you're out of impact, figuring out all of the things that led to you being in the position that you're in, it's a relatively unimportant question. The only exception of when knowing why is important is if it's going to help mitigate an urgent spread or reoccurrence. Other than that, all you should care about is getting out of impact into a stable state. The algorithm guided decisions that we talked about earlier can help facilitate this. The next takeaway that I wanna mention is the scene survey. It's really easy to focus on what appears to be the most immediate problem and sort of block everything else out. In medicine, you always make sure that the scene is safe before you step in so that you don't create a second victim. For SRE, preventing a second victim means taking a pause and asking something like, how likely is it that what I am about to do could actually make things worse? For example, how likely are you to inadvertently create a thundering herd? The second thing that you always hear as a medical first responder is notice who's yelling, notice who's quiet. People instinctively want to run towards the person who's yelling, but the person who's quiet because they can't yell for whatever reason, Maybe they can't breathe, maybe they're unconscious, whatever it may be, um, they're often your most critical patient. So in the same way, it's really easy to look at a bunch of alerts that are all flashing red. I mean, we've all been there, right? You see the dashboard, everything is red in front of you, like all you can think about is the red. But take a second to look around, look upstream, look, has any of your systems gone quiet? 
I recognize that what I just said is quite basic to the more advanced incident commanders in the audience. So if you've kind of tuned out a little bit, go ahead and come back because you're, here's your takeaway. Two points. Point one, regardless of experience, it's always wise to remember to ask yourself at decision points if the path you're going down is currently the fastest and the best path out of impact. Point two, if you already know everything that I've said, I want you to think about how you're going to get the service owners, the developers, even the executives who are going to join your bridges into this mindset as well. This might seem natural to you and me. It's not a natural mindset for most people who don't spend a lot of time on critical incidents. Most people come in and they wanna ask what I call the cascading series of whys. They wanna diagnose. You have to figure out how you can switch people into get out of impact mode from that mode. So you can handle those five whys type questions in something like a retrospective. What you need is for everyone to focus during a critical incident response on how to best stop the impact quickly, get the production system out of impact. Don't let a system bleed out in front of you while you debate a diagnosis or a path forward. So my question to you, if you already knew everything that I've said so far, is how are you going to enable and train the people that you work with who aren't necessarily in SRE, but will be joining your bridges to do that and have that mindset in the context of your company's culture? The last concept that I wanna talk about is creating and implementing standardized protocols and checklists. The basic concept is that when you're faced with that adrenaline rush of a major outage, people forget to do the things that they would have otherwise had no problem remembering. So steps might be skipped that would ordinarily not be forgotten. People's attention sort of splinters in all these different directions. Everyone may assume that someone else was taking care of that one important thing. Don't create an unnecessary failure point. Don't leave to chance or to memory what you can checklist. This approach is based on the World Health Organization's surgical checklists and other similar work. You would be surprised at how simple these questions are. It's things like, does the patient have any known drug allergies? Is this the correct surgery site? The rationale here is why create opportunities for small errors to occur early in a process that would potentially have catastrophic consequences down the line. So incidents, especially incidents with a large blast radius and multiple teams involved, they're often chaotic by nature, particularly when they're first spinning up. Much like surgical checklists, creating SRE checklists and procedures for different phases of the incident response can help standardize that response among teams, reduce errors, and ensure that essential items are not missed. I tend to propose three types of checklists. So the first one, it's a personal checklist. What are the things specific to how you work during an incident that you want to cognitively offload? So if you think about like what are the things that you might forget at 2 a.m. when pager duty has just gone off and you're exhausted and you're groggy and you haven't had caffeine? Put those things on a checklist. The second thing is an SRE team checklist. So what are the shared tasks or checks that you and your SRE team want to make sure happen during an incident? You want this somewhere everyone can see it, everybody can contribute to it. This is very important for collaboration. The third checklist is going to be for non-SRE teams joining the incident. So depending on your organization, these might be specific to teams or groups. It might be one general checklist that every team use uses. But what are the things that you want to make sure happen when X, Y, Z team joins your sub-zero that might otherwise get overlooked in all the hustle and bustle? It's worth noting these don't have to be paper checklists. You don't like have to run around with a legal pad. I've seen some amazing slap box help with this. I've seen some great custom tooling do, do things for this. Implement it however it works for your team. So let's take a moment to recap. We talked about three different concepts from the medical field that I hope will be useful to you and your organization. They were, one, enable quick incident decision-making through algorithm-guided response patterns. Two, use triage and stabilization to reduce the acute impact, and three, rely on standardization and checklists. Again, these are all designed to be parts of the Incident Response Foundation. The hope is that they provide benefits such as improved time to restore, a smaller blast radius, lower cognitive overhead, and more effective incident management. Thank you all so much for your time. I hope this has been valuable to you. I'll be hanging around the Slack. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks again.